Germany, after World War I, was about as chaotic as a country can be. Full of the empire, hyperinflation, foreign occupation, political violence, coup attempts, this guy. It's common knowledge that fascism took over Germany in 1933, but what popular history usually leaves out is that there were many points in this period where it could have gone in the exact opposite direction. Communism. Alternate histories for Germany mostly discuss what could have happened if they won one or both world wars, and people often don't grasp the scale of communism as a political force in this period. Bavaria had a short-lived Soviet Republic in 1919, the Ruhr Red Army of 1920 had at least 50,000 soldiers, the March Action of 1923 involved 200,000 strikers. All of these revolts failed, sure, but the potential for a full-scale revolution was there. This of course begs the question, what if it went that way? What we call the German Revolution refers to a period starting in 1918, with what was basically a civil war in 1919 and revolutionary upheaval continuing until 1923. The November Revolution specifically refers to the events of the 9th of November 1918, the day the German Empire collapsed, almost exactly one year after the October Revolution in Russia. The toll of World War I was the main cause for the revolution, and the nexus of anti-war resistance in Germany was in the labour movement through organisations such as the Revolutionary Stewards. When defeat in the war was certain, the Empire made several frantic attempts to maintain itself, but starting with a mutiny by sailors on the 3rd of November, a wave of strikes, desertions and mutinies spread like wildfire. Workers and soldiers council sprung up and seized control of the country with the imperial government powerless to stop the revolt. Towards the end of the war and during the revolution itself, leadership of the Social Democratic Party of Germany worked tirelessly to avoid a revolution altogether, as they preferred a constitutional monarchy to a republic. Only when revolution became unavoidable did they join the revolutionaries, which they then worked to stop from within. Through subversion of the councils and most infamously employment of far-right proto-Nazi paramilitaries, the SDP assured its dominance. To understand how the German Revolution could have succeeded, we need to look at where the German revolutionaries failed, where, by contrast, the Russian revolutionaries succeeded. In Russia, the labor movement was divided between Bolsheviks, Mensheviks, and social revolutionaries, who by the outbreak of World War I all had separate parties. Because of this, the distinction between one and the other was obvious to everyone. They could organize separately, and nobody held delusions of unity amongst the three wildly different factions. However, when war broke out in Germany, the communists, known as Spartacists, the democratic socialists, and the social democrats were all in a single party. This even remained the case when, at the start of the war, social democrat members of the Reichstag voted in favor of war credits, or in other words, in favor of funding the imperialist war. The communists and democratic socialists felt baffled and betrayed by this, but there was no actual party split until 1917, when the left of the SPD formed the USPD. Germany didn't even have a communist party until New Year's 1919, after the November Revolution. So for the sake of this scenario, the point of divergence won't be in 1919, but much earlier, in 1914. When the SDP Reichstag members voted for war credits, the party began to break down as the left vehemently protested the SPD's actions, and by 1916, they had split off entirely to form the Communist Party of Germany. Over the course of the war, the party worked tirelessly with independent unions and other such working class organizations to fight against the war and for the overthrow of the empire, culminating on November 9th, 1918, when the Communist Party of Germany led a nationwide insurrection against the empire. The Kaiser was forced to abdicate and the Reichstag was dissolved, giving way to the establishment of the Free Socialist Republic of Germany. Upon the success of the insurrection, a Congress of Workers and Soldiers Councils was called in Berlin to lay down the foundations of the new governments. A whole wave of socialist documents were passed into law, and the councils enshrined their supreme executive and legislative power. At the first Congress of the Councils, Karl Liebknecht was appointed Chairman of the Council's Executive Committee which effectively made him leader of the Republic and in charge of day-to-day -day affairs. Liebknecht was an icon of the anti-war movement in Germany, and he literally made a proclamation of a socialist republic in our timeline, so he'd have been a shoo-in for a leader. However, as the Republic was modelled on the system of council democracy, any leader position was ultimately beholden to the will of the councils. Something similar is true of the KPD itself, 
while big figures like Luxembourg and Liebnik get all the attention, it's the tens of thousands of unknown and anonymous party militants who do the vast majority of the work. The council system is too complicated for me to explain in full here, but the point is that institutions are organized from the bottom up in a kind of radical democracy, where workers had collective control over the economy and representatives could be recalled instantly if they were incompetent or turned their coat. Contrast this with a parliamentary system, where you just elect someone to sit in parliament and they can do whatever they want until their term is up. The most pressing matter for the new Spartacist government was, of course, ensuring an end to the First World War. In our timeline, the armistice was agreed on November 11th, 1918, and the treaty to end the war proper was signed on October 21st, 1919, almost a full year later. For our alternate Treaty of Versailles, the Entente viewed a communist Germany as an even more dire threat than the German Empire, and as such would have quickly imposed vicious terms, forcing greater territorial concessions than in our own timeline. Part of the reason why some of the delegates at Versailles, especially the American and British delegates, wanted much less harsh terms on Germany was because they had hoped that Germany would have become a friendly business partner on the European stage, a counterweight to potential French hegemony and a shield against Bolshevik Russia. However, in a timeline where Germany is communist, all of this went out the window. For the alternate treaty, imagine terms as harsh as the Treaty of brest from our timeline. With peace secured, the KPD turned inside. The new government was a dictatorship of the proletariat. That is, a regime of suppression imposed by the councils and the communist party on the bourgeoisie and their allies. While the Spartacists historically were repulsed at the extent of the terror imposed by the Bolsheviks, there's a common misconception that they represented a sort of libertarian communist alternative to Bolshevism. The Spartacists still favoured a dictatorship of the proletariat, meaning rule without limits imposed upon the enemies of the state. Sure, they would have been quote-unquote less authoritarian than the Bolsheviks, and wouldn't have repressed council democracy in the same way, but it wouldn't have felt like a libertarian alternative for any reactionaries. Also, the distinction is less an ideological one and more due to the development of state power in Germany compared to Russia. Germany was a heavily developed capitalist country in 1918. Russia was... not. So repression of enemies of the regime would have been much more efficient and much less brutal. The most obvious consequence of all of this is that this guy would have never amounted to anything more than a historical footnote. At most, he'd get a mention at the bottom of a Wikipedia article about a German nationalist emigre community in Austria, because, wow man, that Adolf could sure fire up a crowd. In the Weimar Republic of our world, art and culture entered something of a renaissance as many of the conservative social values of the old empire began to fade away. Music, theatre, the visual arts, science, progressive social values, the whole lot had run wild. All of this came to an end with, you know, but in this timeline, he's not here. He's just some random Austrian incel. Spartacist culture of the alternate 1920s was a lot like the Weimar culture of the same period, only, well, more. A lot more. The flight of German artists and scientists afraid of Nazi persecution would have, of course, never happened but in its place was a brain drain of aristocratic scholars. While this was no doubt damaging, countless other unknown scientists, the anonymous mass who do the real brunt of the work in innovation, along with scholars sympathetic to socialism would have stayed, and that all ensured that Spartacist Germany was a powerful player in the realm of science. With the abolition of the whole criminal code of the old empire, restrictions placed on marginalized minorities would have been abolished too. The Weimar Republic had what queer history remembers as the world's first clinic for transgender healthcare, and there's little reason to think it wouldn't have also popped up here. Bigotry was still common, but it eroded much quicker compared to our own timeline. There might have even been open social and legal acceptance of gay relationships, or a fundamental shakeup of the concepts of family itself. But whatever this Germany looked like, the treaty had shrunk it. Any overseas German territories were immediately occupied by the Entente. In the occupied Rhineland, France established a puppet regime to maintain a modicum of legitimacy, though it's unlikely that the local workers took kindly to it. That said, due to the nature of the situation, such terms could have only been imposed with any lasting effect on Germany's western borders, as the greatest power to their east was Bolshevik Russia. By the time peace was agreed between the Entente and Spartacist Germany, Russia was embroiled in a civil war. The Spartacists saw this situation and moved to assist the Bolsheviks with whatever they could muster. But wait, weren't Bolsheviks like Lenin and Spartacists like Luxembourg constantly at ideological odds with one another? Are you saying they'd become allies? 
Isn't inner fighting the one thing leftists are good at? <laughs> well, the thing about that is, shut up. While many of the Spartacists had strong criticisms of the Bolsheviks, they kept these critiques amongst themselves as they didn't want to stir up anti-Bolshevik sentiment by mistake. At the conclusion of Luxembourg's critique of the Bolsheviks, she wrote that it would be demanding something superhuman from the Bolsheviks to build a perfect socialist democracy in their challenging and unprecedented situation. So, uh, yeah, they'd, they'd get along. It's indeed possible that a term of the imposed treaty would have been forbidding any alliance between Germany and Russia, but it's just as likely that such a term would have been impossible to enforce. In our own world, French soldiers conducted a large socialist mutiny in 1917, and part of French war propaganda was the claim that the war against Germany was a progressive war against a reactionary empire. Ordering those same soldiers to go in and crush a revolution would have risked a revolution in France itself, as it so blatantly contradicted their own propaganda. Of course, on Germany's eastern border lay Poland. The Polish-Soviet war of our own timeline was one of the most critical losses for the Bolsheviks. Polish defeat was all but certain, but mistakes by Red Army Command gave the Polish army room for a counter-offensive, which meant Soviet Russia was cut off from the rest of Europe. But in this timeline, upon the beginning of the war, Germany intervened from Poland's west. Rosa Luxemburg finally achieves her dream of annihilating Polish independence. That's a joke, lads. <laughs> Also in this period, there were numerous other socialist and communist revolts across Europe. And while Russia was a quote-unquote base for communists, it wasn't particularly strong. But with a powerful base in Germany and Russia, one by one, country after country would have turned red, either through insurrections receiving greater support or by direct invasion. Given that in this new timeline, Germany and Russia had independent communist parties during the First World War, They'd have formed an international alliance of communist parties at some point during the war, with it growing in ranks as communist parties sprung up in other countries. By 1919, this alliance was known as the Communist International, an alliance of communist governments and parties across the world. This was separate from the formation of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, as not every country in the Comintern joined in because the issues they faced were vastly different from those facing Russia. For the USSR specifically, the proposal of socialism in one country we're familiar with held no weight, as Germany provided all the machinery and tools needed for industrialization. Also, the breakdown of Bolshevik party unity that came as a result of Russia's isolated position would have been avoided. In effect, this means an elimination of the conditions that gave rise to Stalinism. And while Bolshevik Russia was still absolutely authoritarian, the aims and interests that this authoritarianism served was completely changed. There certainly wouldn't have been the purges on the scale seen of the 1930s of our own timeline, or any of the other mad excesses of Stalin's regime. Then if it's not Stalin, who succeeds Lenin? Trotsky? Bukharin? You're all wrong. Alexei Rykov succeeds Lenin. Why? Because damn, look at that beard! S-tier facial hair was a requirement for communists in this period. Except the Italians. They get a pass. Oh, speaking of whom. The revolutions of the period weren't just in Russia and Germany, they were all over Europe. Italy in particular found itself in the two red years, where all the pieces were in place for a revolution to succeed, but as leadership amongst the revolutionary workers was entrusted to moderate social democrats, the orders to begin the insurrection at the crucial moments during the factory occupations of 1920 never came. Fascism in Italy was a weak movement in 1919. The fact that the two red years didn't amount to a full-scale revolution allowed a fascist reaction from conservative elements of Italian society, primarily the middle class with support from the police and military. If in this timeline the fascists proved themselves capable of fighting the communists, they'd be given the keys to the kingdom, as in our own timeline. Yet unlike our timeline, communist resistance to the fascist regime was far stronger owing to support from Germany, with the potential for a full-scale civil war aimed at toppling the regime. Whatever the situation, the capitalist states in Western Europe looked on in horror. While they may have wanted to send whatever they had to support anti-communist forces, they'd have to contend with their own working population first, who weren't fond of having another war start so soon and were flooded with agitation propaganda from the Comintern. As the possibility of communist revolutions in their own countries became more and more possible, either the governments of these countries turned to fascism or something similar, much like Italy did to crack down hard on communism. Or they maintained hope that moderate social democrats would have taken lead in the labour movement and quelled any revolutionary appetite. Eventually, tensions would have come to a tipping point and direct war would have broken out. It didn't matter who invaded who, as this war would have been a war unlike any other, 
where each side knew that defeat or surrender was not an option under any circumstances, where the home front was just as much as a theatre as the battlefields. The core of Comintern military strategy would have focused on defending their own revolutions while fostering revolution amongst enemy states, by whatever means available. It's impossible to know how this war would have played out as there's just too many unknowns to build a complete picture, but do remember that the Bolsheviks of our own world fought a civil war besieged on every side, with foreign support flooding in to support the white armies, and the Bolsheviks won! Now imagine what a united communist Russia, Germany, and whoever else they picked up along the way could have done. The collapse of German capitalism would have more than anything led to a collapse of European capitalism in general, however long it might have taken. And from there, anything could have been possible. Whatever the immediate military outcome was, one thing was abundantly clear. The future of Europe belonged to communism. And, uh, thanks for watching the video. I uh, put a lot of time into this. I generally have not felt this much motivation to work on a video project in years, so I hope you liked it. I want to thank the friends who reviewed the script and suggested changes, and give a special thanks to my brother who let me use his audio setup to record the audio for the main parts of the video. I'm recording this on a much more basic setup, so that's why it sounds like crap. Oh, um, uh, I uh, want to note as well the uh, flag and symbol I used to represent the Spartacists and the uh, communist German government. Uh, it wasn't used historically. I made it up. No, not this time. It's totally made up. Pure fiction. Uh, the aesthetics I tried going for were my best attempt to create something original that was in line with the communist aesthetics of the period. Like the uh, Bolsheviks, they abandoned any symbols of the old Tsarist Empire or the short-lived Republic. So I think the Spartacists probably would have done the same thing, and like not used a German flag with a symbol on it or anything like that. And yeah, in general I had to do a lot of extrapolating and just had to straight up make shit up when it came up to the aesthetics, as communists in the period just basically all used the same symbols. Like, communist Hungary didn't use this as its flag, it just had a red flag, but I used this because it was used by the Communist Party later in its history, so I thought it worked. Yeah, when, I, when I'm trying to make two country characters look distinct, I, I can't really just use historically accurate flags because it's all just red. It, it's fine though, it's also no history. All also no history is just conjecture. I'm just doing it for fun. So it doesn't really matter if it's 100% accurate. It's fiction. We made it up. We made this one up. It's a right. made up tale. That's, that's important, by the way. Like, don't take anything I've said as a definitive, this is what definitely would have happened because. It's, it's impossible to know, it's just my best estimation based on what I've read, what I've remembered I've read. Yeah, uh, if you know the period, if you're interested in the topic, I encourage you to present your own estimation of what could have happened to a world with a communist Germany in the comments. There's probably a lot of room for a fun conversation. And I'm not just saying this to uh, boost this video statement in the placement in the algorithm to uh, get more of those sweet, sweet views. Um, either no one's going to watch this video or it's going to go super viral. Neither one of the two. Can't be both. Well, probably can't be both. I think I'll just cut.